Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning dear students, welcome to my class. This is lecture number 19. In this lecture, we will be discussing the policies adopted by one of the most benevolent governors general appointed by the British. It was none other than William Bendick. His full name William Cavendish Bendick. He started his career as an ensign that is a rank below the warrant officer in army. But from the low position of the ensign, he reached the position of the lieutenant colonel in the British army. In 1796, he became the member of British parliament. He also fought against the revolutionary and Napoleonic forces in France. While considering the military experience of William Bendick, he was appointed as the governor of Madras by the British government in 1803. His appointment was made in the backdrop of French designs in the Dakar. It was during the period of William Bendick as the governor of Madras, Vellur Mutani took place in 1806. Vellur Mutani broke out following the denial by the commander in chief of the army that Indian shiboys would not wear any cost marks or wear earrings. Against these prohibitions, the shiboys in Vellu rose in revolt against the British. But the British was able to suppress Vellu Mutani with iron hand. Even though it was during the period of William Bendick as the governor of Madras, the British was able to suppress Bellur Mutani. His service as the governor of Madras was terminated by the court of directors. However, in 1828, Lord William Bendick was appointed as the governor general of Bengal by the British government. William Bendick reached India as the Governor General in 1828 and he remained as the Governor General till 1835. He reached India as the Governor General of Bengal but returned as the Governor General of India. During his period as the Governor General, he took several reform measures. His measures were aimed to end the evil practices of Sadi and female infanticide and he established law and order by suppressing the robber tax who engaged in robbery and plundering like the Pindaris of the Western India. And it was the period of William Bendick, Indians began to be recruited massively in subordinate services. One of the greatest development took place during the period of William Bendick was none other than the introduction of the English system of learning 
or popularly known as Western learning in India. Later it made far reaching changes in India. Starting with one of the most important administrative reform carried out by William Bendick that is abolition of Sadi. None of the previous governor generals had taken strenuous measures to intervene in the social and customs practices of the Indians as William Bendick done. He tried to reform the Hindu society by abolishing the evil practice of Sadi and by suppressing the female infanticide. Sadi meant the burning of the widow in the funeral fire of her husband. It was originated in India with the invasion of the Indo Scythians. These invaders of Indo Scythians who brought the practice of Sadi in India. And from the Iran inscription, from this inscription, the first Sadi was reported in India was in 510 AD. It was Indo Scythians who brought the evil practice of Sadi to India. According to Iran inscription of 510 AD, the first occurrence of Sadi was reported in India in the year of 510. And many liberal rulers had tried to abolish this evil practice of Sadi. Many enlightened rulers had abolished this evil practice of Sadi, burning of the widow in the funeral fire of their husband. Emperor Akbar, who had made serious measures to ban the practice of Sadi in Mughal Empire. Then the Marathas in Western India, who had forbidden the evil practice of Sadi in their dominions. The Portuguese in Goa, Goa was the center of the Portuguese settlements in India. The Goa, in Goa the Portuguese also tried to ban this evil practice of Sadi. Likewise, the French at Chandarnagar was the center of French settlements in eastern India. In Chandarnagar, the French also tried to abolish the practice of Sadi. However, with the Battle of Plassey and the Bexar, the English East India Company got political power. Even after getting the political power in Bengal, the English East India Company did not intervene. The social affairs of the Indians and did not come forward to abolish the evil practice of Sadi. Why did English East India Company? Why did not English East India Company come forward to abolish the evil practice of Sadi? It was mainly due to the fear of adverse reaction from the native Indians. The British feared that if they attempt to modernize or to abolish the evil practices, native Indians could come against them. It was because of this fear, the English East India Company did not intervene the social customs, practices and the beliefs of the Indians. However, after the period of Warren Hastings, 
Lord Cornwallis, Mindo, and Lord Hastings had taken some steps towards the abolition of the evil practice of Sadi. What measures these governor generals did take? They discouraged the observance of the practice of Sadi by compulsion. Nobody should cumbal a person to commit Sadi and they restricted it by forbidding intoxicating of drugs to the sorrows stricken widows by using poison to the sorrow stricken widows. It was also forbidden by these governor generals. They also banned the banning of pregnant women as well as banned the banning of the widows below 16 years of age. They did not adopt a complete ban of the Sadi, but they restricted to pregnant women as well as the widows below 16 years of age. In addition to that, the presence of the police personnel was made compulsory at the time of the sacrifice. The police officers were deployed to ensure that nobody was compelled to perform this evil practice of sadi, but these restrictions did not completely ban and did not adopt any punishment for abating or forcing a person to commit this evil practice. It was Rajara Mohan Roy, he started a crusading attack against the observance of this evil practice in Bengal with the loss of his sister-in-law by Sadi. His sister-in-law was forced to commit this evil practice of Sadi despite her wishes, she was forced to do so. It created in Rajara Mohan Roy to fight against the evil practice. He started publication of a number of pamphlets condemning the observance of this evil practice. His arguments were supported by many progressive Indian newspapers, but the orthodox section of the Hindus was against the opinions of Raja Ramohan Roy. Now, the conscience of the nation had been awakened. Before in legislating a ban on the evil practice of Sadi, William Bendick had collected secret reports relevant to facts and figures whether there was to ensure that whether there was any possibility of open rebellion against the British if this practice was abolished. He got secret reports from the army officers, judges of the Nisamat Adalat, it was the criminal court of justice, settled appeal cases and police superintendents of the lower and upper provinces. Secret reports were collected from police officials, judges and army officers to ensure that whether there is there was any possibility of 
rebellion against the British if this such practice of sati was abolished or not. After the collection of secret reports from the army officers, police and judges, William Wendy came to the conclusion that there was no possibility of civil rebellion if the evil practice of sati was abolished. So, convinced it, there was no possibility of open rebellion against the British. Now, William Bendick made up his mind to end the evil practice of Sadi through legislations. Through the regulation 13, sorry, 17, through the regulation 17 of December 1829. The practice of sadi was abolished in Bengal presidency and now it declared the practice of sadi or burning of widows alive declared illegal. Burning of the widows in the funeral fire of the husband was made an illegal practice and punishable by a criminal court as culpable homicide. But this regulation of 1829, regulation 17 passed in December 1829 was made applicable only in Bengal presidency. In 1829, Sadi was not abolished across the country, but it was abolished only in Bengal presidency. But in 1830, the modified version of the regulation 17 of 1829 was made applicable to the subordinate presidencies of Bombay and Madras. As Lord William Bendick believed earlier based on the secret reports collected from judges, police and army officers, no open rebellion broke out following the ban on the practice of Sadi. But still, a few orthodox Bengalis made an appeal to the Privy Council, that is the highest court of appeal, against the government's interference in their religious customs. These orthodox Bengalis wanted to continue this practice of sadi. That is why they submitted petitions to the Privy Council, the highest court of appeal in Britain, following which counter petitions were made to the British Crown by Rajara Mohan Roy and Devendranath Tagore. Even though the petition submitted by orthodox Bengalis were not considered by the Privy Council and the home government in Britain did not nullify the regulations made by William Bendick. Now, this practice was banned in Bengal presidency in 1829 following which in 1830 it was banned in Bombay and Madras presidencies. Now, another evil practice which had crept in Hindu society was female infanticide and child sacrifices. This killing of infant girls, they expressed the desire for the birth of boys rather than girls. Girls were considered as a source of misery. So, they wanted the birth of son instead of girls and that is why they killed these girls 
either by poisoning or not giving care they usually to kill these female children. This practice was mainly prevalent among some Rajabut tribes and it was in practice among the Rajabut in Benares region, Jarija Rajabuts of Kutch and Gujarat. Similar cases were also reported from Rathors of Jaipur and Jodhpur. It also reported from Jats and Mevadis. However, female infanticide had already been made, had already been banned even before the period of Lord William Bendick as the Governor General. It was banned this evil practice of female infanticide had already been banned through the Bengal regulation of 21 of 1795 and regulation 3 of 1804 during the period of Wellesley. But even though it was banned through regulations, still the evil practice of female infanticide and ch child sacrifices continued among these Dajabut tribes. In this background, William Wendy came forward to suppress this evil practice of female infanticide and its child sacrifices once for all. He suppressed these evil practices effectively. Now, the suppression of this tax, these tax who were modeled more or, more, or, more or less upon the Pindaris. It was during the period of the Governor General Lord Hastings. Lord Hastings, these Pindaris were suppressed in Western India and Central India. Likewise, likewise the Pindaris, the thugs also lived on plunder and robbery. They began to grow, these thugs began to grow or their number cells and their atrocities increased with the breakdown of the police system following the decline of the Mughal Empire in India. The public roads were become unsafe for the travelers. They were looted, plundered and killed by these thugs. The petty officers of the small states in central India were incapable to deal with these plunderers. These thugs were active in areas from out to Hyderabad and in Dejabutana and in Bundel country. In these regions, the thugs committed different kinds of atrocities and engaged in plundering, looting and the killing of the innocent people and took away the wealth of the victims. They belonged both the religions of the Hindu as well as Muhammadan. After killing the victim, their heads were offered to the Hindu goddesses of Kali, Durga and Fawani. These were the practices followed by the Thaks. 
during the period of William Bendick, the public opinion came forward to suppress the tax once for all. It made the life of the people miserable. The people were not in a position to move from one place to another at night because of the fear of this tax. Now, the Bendik government started operations against the tax. The charge of the suppression of this tax was given to Colonel William Sleeman. He effectively suppressed the tax. He arrested 1500 tax during the military operation. They were either sentenced to death or sent for jail for life. These activities or the atrocities of the tax in an organized manner came to an end by 1837 because of the efforts taken by William Bendick. Now, coming to removal of distinctions between the Indians and the Britishers in public services. Lord Cornwallis was in favor of removing all differences in recruitment to the posters and the services of the English East India Company. He laid down that the appointment should be based on merit. And he required it to incorporate in the Charter Act of 1833. And because of the instance made by William Bendick, a clause was inserted in the Charter Act of 1833 that the public services and the posters under the English East India Company would be opened to all Indians and the British subjects and the recruitment would be based on open competitive examinations. That means the appointment should be based on merit rather than patronage and it would, would be opened to Indians. And by this clause, the British government removed all barriers based on religion, caste and the community. This section of 1870-1887 of the Charter Act of 1813 dealt with this provision of the removal of distinctions between uh, British subjects and the Indians. However, through the Charter Act of 1833, the, this discrimination was removed it only remained in paper. In practice, this old system was continued. Indians were not given appointment in covenanted services. Still, the Britishers occupied higher posts and the services of the English East India Company. Similar provision was also included in the Charter Act of 1853. The Charter Act of 1853 made it clear that appointments in the services and the posters of the English East India Company should be based on open competitive examination. But after the rebellion of 1857 again in 1858, it was made clear that open competitive examination should be introduced. However, the Civil Service Act was passed only in 1861. So, this removal of the discrimination in appointment 
was removed through the Charter Act of 1833. In practice, it remained only in principle. No effective measures were taken by the British government. In practice, it removed these barriers of recruitment to the Indians in higher posts, services of the English East India Company. Indians were not appointed to the commissioned ranks of the army. And in army, they could rise only up to the post of Subedar. All other higher posts were grabbed by the Britishers. Even with the great fighting capacity and great valor, Indians could rise only up to the post of Subedar. Likewise, in civil service and judiciary, Indians were not appointed in higher posts. One of the greatest reforms made during the period of Lord William Bendick was none other than educational reforms. Now, you recall the Charter Act of 1813. This was the second Charter Act passed by the British Parliament relating to Indian administration. In the Charter Act of 1813, there was a provision providing an amount to the tune of 1 lakh rupees for the educational and the cultural development of the Indians. However, 1 lakh rupees was provided for the first time for the cultural and educational development of the Indians, differences arose immediately between two groups. They were Anglicist and Orientalist. It was for the first time the government took the responsibility of education by granting 1 lakh rupees for the educational upliftment of the native Indians. But once the amount was granted to the tune of 1 lakh rupees, two different groups emerged following which they divided on the following questions. They came in known as Anglicist and Orientalist. They divided on following questions. Whether the company would use the money for the development of Oriental learning or Western learning. Oriental learning means the teaching of Indian classics, Indian literature, Indian philosophy, Indian science through the medium of vernacular language. It came in known as Oriental learning. The support of, supporters of this Oriental learning came in known as Orientalist. The prominent Orientalist were Herman Wilson and Prince of Brothers, James Prince of and Henry Prince of. This Orientalist stood for the introduction of the Oriental learning in India, that is, teaching of Indian classics, Indian philosophy, Indian literature, Indian science through the medium of vernacular language. They came into known as Orientalist. And the other group came into known as Anglicist or Occidentalist. They were led by Charles Trevelyan. They demanded that Western learning should be introduced in India. Western learning means that the teachings of European science, European literature, European mathematics through the medium of English, it came in known as Western learning. The protagonists of Western learning came in known as Anglicist. They demanded the introduction of the Western learning. The Orientalist on the other turn demanded that introduction of the Oriental learning in India. What was the standard taken by 
Indians during this controversy on this debate. The socio religious reform leaders like Rajaram Mohan Roy took the side that Western learning should be introduced in India. He believed that by introducing Western learning, rationalism and scientific approach could be developed among the Indians. That is why Rajara Mohan Roy stood for the introduction of the Western learning in India. And this controversy between the Anglicists and the Orientalist came in known as Anglicist Orientalist controversy. One group sided for the introduction of the Oriental learning, while on the other hand, the other group demanded the introduction of the Western learning. Then, with the appointment of the Thomas Babington Macaulay as the president of the General Committee on Public Instruction, General Committee on Public Instruction, he was appointed as the president by the government of William Bendick. Once Thomas Babington Macaulay became the President of the General Committee on Public Instruction. He took the side of the Anglicis that he was in favor of the promotion of the Western learning in India. In his famous minute, dated 2nd February 1835, he argued that the Western learning should be introduced in India. Western learning means the teaching of European science, European literature, European philosophy, European classics through the medium of English would be introduced in India. Macaulay had a very low opinion about Oriental learning and his words taken from his minute of 1835. From the minutes of Macaulay, we come across with the, his argument. His argument was that the argument made by Thomas Babington Macaulay was that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Again, from the famous minute, Macaulay minute of 1835, his another argument, it was his aim behind the introduction of the English system of learning in India. The aim of the introduction of the English system of education in India can be hagged from this observation made by Thomas Babington Macaulay. He wrote that by introducing the English system of learning in India, the aim was to create a class of Indians in blood and color only. But English in tastes, in opinions, in morals and intellect. It was with this aim, the Western learning was to be introduced in India. These were the observations made by Thomas Babington Macaulay. These views put forward by Thomas Babington Macaulay as the president of the General Committee on, yeah, Committee on Public Instruction was at, accepted by William Bendick on, on a resolution dated 7 March 1835. With the, this, this resolution dated 7 March 1835, William Bendick introduced the Western learning or English education in India. With the introduction of the English system of learning in India in 1835, Persian was abolished as the court language. Now the Cases could be filed in 
Indian any Indian languages or the English. English was adopted as the court language instead of Persian. The publication of books in English was made comparatively free. In 1835, another notable achievement was the opening of the Calcutta Medical College in 1835. It was the first western medical school in all of Asia. It was created during the period of William Bendig as the Governor General of India. In this medical college created in Calcutta, a people was admitted irrespective of the caste or creed to which they belonged. Now coming to the major financial reforms introduced by William Bendick as the Governor General. The war with Burma depleted the treasury of the English East India Company. So, more financial reforms were required to improve the financial conditions of the English East India Company in India. In 1828, in the same year, William Bendick was appointed as the Governor General of Bengal. During his appointment as the Governor General of Bengal, public expenditure exceeded the revenue. Expenditure was high rather than the revenue. So, he appointed two committees to study how to reduce the expenditure. One committee was appointed to examine how to expenditure would be made in military. The second committee was to inquire into the reduction of expenditure in civil service. These two committees were appointed by William Bendick government following the depletion of the treasury of the English East India Company. The task of these two committees was to suggest measures for affecting economy in expenditure or the reduction of expenditure in civil and military departments of the English East India Company. Under special circumstances, it was during the period of Lord William Bendick, the Court of Directors under the direction from the Court of Directors, William Bendick reduced the batter. Beta means additional allowance paid to the military officer. It came into known as Beta. William Bendick took away the practice of giving Beta to the military officers. He made a new rule regarding the granting of Beta or additional allowance to the military officers. What was the new rule? In case of the stationing of the army within the radius of 400 miles of Calcutta, one half batta or additional allowance would be allowed, only one half would be allowed. From the reduction of batta, William Bendick was able to save 20,000 British pounds in a year. Likewise, William Bendick also reduced the allowances given to civil servants of the English East India Company. It was during the period of 
William Bendick, effective measures were used for the collection of land revenue in Bengal. Earlier, it was during the period of Lord Cornwallis, permanent land revenue system settlement was introduced in Bengal. But oppressive measures were adopted by the Semindars, making the life of the peasants miserable. And it was not possible to collect the land tax fixed by the British government. But this permanent land revenue system of settlement got reformed and land revenue began to flow from Bengal to the coffers of the English East India Company. Likewise, the land revenue system of settlement introduced in northwestern provinces, a present day UP, United Province. Where from the territories of Nawab of Houth had acquired by the British government. In northwestern provinces, under the supervision of Martin's Birch, the British government introduced the Magalwari system of settlement, Mahal or village, was made responsible for the collection of land revenue from the peasants as, and the British collected in turn this land revenue from the village headman. The village was made the basis for the collection of land revenue. Under this system, village was made responsible for the collection of land revenue from the peasants and payment to the British. And this system of Magalbari settlement got introduced effectively during the period of the Martin's birth and it provided much needed revenue to the English East India Company during the period of William Bendick. He also took certain effective measures for the reduction of the expenditure of the government. He reduced the costly settlement in the sites of Malacca and in addition to that, wherever possible, he appointed Indians to the subordinate services of the English East India Company instead of high paid Europeans. In the same post, Europeans were paid higher salary. For example, in army, an Indian Shiboy was paid 79 rupees Indian Shiboy. What about the salary given to British Shiboy? British Shiboy was given 27 rupees per month. But the Indian Shiboy was it to give only one third of the his British counterpart. So, in this background, wherever possible, the William Bendick appointed Indians to the subordinate services. But even during the period of William Bendick, Indians were not admitted into the higher civil services or the higher posters of the army or the higher posters of the judiciary. All the higher posters in judiciary, civil service, and army were exclusively reserved for the Indians even during the period of Liberal Governor General William Bendick. It was during the period of William Bendick, opium trade was regularized and licensed. Earlier, opium was smuggled, especially to China. Now it got uh, regularized as well as license. Only licenses were allowed to export opium and in future he made that opium would be exported through the port of Bombay. Only through the Bombay port opium would be exported. 
it gave the English East India Company a share in the profits in the form of duties. Export duty was imposed on the export of opium from India to other places and by adopting these financial measures, William Bendig was able to earn 2 crore rupees per annum. Now coming to the judicial reforms introduced by William Bendig, he abolished the provincial courts of appeal and circuit. It was created during the period of Lord Cornwallis. He abolished these provincial courts of appeal and circuit because of the pendency of cases. These courts began to overburden with his work. It took delays in disposal of cases as well as made cumbersome. He abolished this court and transferred the duties to magistrates and collectors. These magistrates and collectors were placed under the control of the Board of Revenue and Circuit. Under the control of the Commissioner of Revenue and Circuit, the district magist the dis magistrates and district collectors began to settle these disputes. And he set up a Sadar Nisamad Adalat which is settled cases, criminal cases in appeal. Appeals were made in criminal cases to Sadar Nisamad Adalat. Likewise, the appeal court in civil cases came into known as Sadar Dibani Adalat. In addition to Calcutta, William Bendick set up a Sadar Dibani Adalat and a Sadar Nisamad Adalat at Allahabad. It was for the residents of the upper provinces and Delhi. Upper provinces present a United Provinces. Uttar Pradesh. It was for these upper provinces and Delhi. Sadar Didwani Adalat and Sadar Nisamad Adalat were set up. Otherwise, the people in these upper provinces were having to travel to Calcutta to file appeals in Sadar Dibani Adalat and Sadar Nisamat Adalat. And it was during the period of William Bendig, Charter Act of 1833 was passed. The Charter Act of 183, 1833 was important from several respects. And it was for the first time under this act the Governor General of Bengal became the Governor General of India. Under this arrangement, who was the first Governor General of India? It was William Bendick. It was during his period this act was passed and William Bendick emerged as the first Governor General of India. The Governor General was given the power of control and superintendence of the civil and military affairs of the subordinate presidencies of Bombay, Madras, Bengal and other territories. It means that these presidencies, subordinate presidencies were put under the strict control of the Governor General of Bengal, sorry, Governor General of India. Now, Governor General of Bengal was given the title of Governor General of India. The subordinate presidencies of Bombay, Madras, Bengal and other territories were exclusively put under the control of Governor General of India. Under the passage of this act, the subordinate presidencies of Bombay and Madras lost their legislative power. Earlier, they had made legislations. Now, the subordinate presidencies would only recommend legislations to the Governor General of India. 
only they could make proposals for legislations to the governor general of india they lost the legislative power the legislative power began to concentrated in the hands of the supreme government headed by the governor general of india at calcutta and a fourth member was added through the charter act of 1833 in the governor general in council he was to be a law member should be a distinguished jurist his duty was to advise the governor general in council on legislative matters mccalley was the first law member in theory he was to sit in the governor general in council only during the legislation 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 was going on but mccalley was admitted into the governor in general in council during all meetings of the council a law commission was constituted in 1833 during the period of william bendick to codify the different types of laws there existed hindu laws mohammedan laws and british laws as far as indian states were concerned he adopted the policy of non interference even in jaipur the resident was attacked william bendick did not interfere but a different policy was adopted towards mysore which was adopted which was amalgamated with the british empire in 1831 gurg was annexed to the british empire in 1834 and central kachar in 1834 he also concluded separate treaties with uh, punjab ruler ranjit singh as well as the amir of sindh in the back backdrop of russian attack these are the questions which now you are able to answer effectively thank you students for watching this class thank you piece of literary snippet we usually know william shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of english literature but we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature and here i am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from macbeth or king lear or julius caesar uh before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams but i am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors tolstoy for instance considered the writings of shakespeare to be and i quote crude immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller provided someone has told him the story earlier now this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true none of shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever they are all written using pre-existing materials pre-existing stories 
Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.